traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Everybody say compassion. He had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Let's pray. God, over these next few moments, Lord, speak to our hearts. God, I pray right now that the word would be deposited. Lord, I step back as you step forward. I decrease as you increase, Lord. Father, less of me and so much more of you. Use me as your as your vessel, God, as your instrument, God. Lord, I just take authority in this room, and I just remove any obstacle, any hindrance, anything that would prevent us from hearing and receiving today, God. I remove it. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And everyone says, amen. Praise God. You may be seated today. Praise the Lord. Well, I uh, I don't know how many of you remember, how many of you remember uh, the the events that happened about five years ago, just a little over five years ago in Thailand, where those 12 boys, it was a soccer team, 12 boys and their coach for a total of 13, they, after practice, decided that they were going to go and, and, and go, go exploring in this cave system that was nearby. And so there they went into the cave system and they started going further and further in and, and, and uh, unexpected to them, right, the rains came, the monsoon rains came a little early that year, and it flooded, it flooded a lot of that cave system to such a degree that the boys became trapped in the, in the caves. How many of you have remember that story? How many of you have seen the movies? There's movies, documentaries, there's been reports, all these things about, you know, these 12 boys with their coach, right, trapped in the cave system. I mean, it was a, this was a dramatic story. There's no denying it. And it got the attention of the whole world. I mean, it's, it's pretty miraculous that any one event can get the attention of the whole world. That everybody rallies around one event. And this is one of those events. If you know the story, you know, people from all over the world came uh, to help to see what they could do to contribute to rescuing these boys and their coach. And it's estimated that in order to rescue those kids, it took over 10,000 people contributing in some fashion. Whether it be a diver, military, experts, uh, health care workers, government officials. Over 10,000 people collaborated to rescue these boys that were trapped. Now, anybody could say and look at that situation and say, well, it's their fault. They got themselves into that situation. But how many of you know that when someone's in danger that you care about, you don't stop to think, and, and you don't stop to start like, or you don't start like blaming them and saying it's your fault. When you love someone and they're in danger, you're going to do whatever you can to help them get free. Can I get an amen? amen. And so it's amazing that the story of, of these young boys and how after, I don't know, I think it was 18 days, finally after 18 days, all of them were rescued. They were taken out of the cave system. It was a huge celebration. And it made me stop to think, is there any other rescue story that even comes close to that? I don't know if there's another rescue story that even comes close to that in our generation, in our time. And as I started thinking about it, I started thinking there is one that eclipses that story. And that's when God saw humanity. And God saw the brokenness in men and women around the world. And God saw how we were broken in our sin, broken in our despair, broken in our anxiety and our stress, broken you know, in our relationships. You name it. How many of you know that on some level we're all broken? And God sees us from heaven and he doesn't condemn us and he doesn't judge us and he's not there to say, I told you and you should have known better. No, God sees us from heaven. God saw humanity from heaven and he says, I'm about to mount the rescue plans of all rescue plans. And he sent his very own son, Jesus. Think about this for just a moment. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, it says, For God so, for God so, he loved the world. He's not mad at the world. He's not, he's not ready to judge the world. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In other words, God didn't give half. God didn't give most. 
God gave it all. Why? Because he sees, he sees us in our, in our despair. He sees us in our trouble. He sees us in, in our time of, 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 of you know, confusion and, and our time of helplessness. He sees our lives. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He didn't give some or most. It says that he gave everything. He gave his only son that whoever were to believe in him, whoever puts their faith, whoever confesses Jesus Christ, it says to him, to that person, to that man, to that woman, it says they should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. The spiritual choice that you make with Jesus will determine your eternal destination. What you say about Jesus, not, not what you say about church, not what you say about me, not what you say about Lifeway, it's what you say about Jesus. It's what have you, what have you committed to in Jesus? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? And the Bible says that God loves us so much that he sees the condition that we're in and he chooses to reach out and he takes and he creates this, this rescue plan to save us. And that's what the cross is all about. The cross was the beginning of the rescue plan. And then he died on the cross. And then he rose again. And the rescue plan. And guess what? Peter in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he gets up to preach the message of Jesus. Three people, 3,000 people, excuse me, get saved. And guess what? It's the rescue plan. And Stephen, the martyr, when, before he dies, he preaches the gospel and people get saved. And the apostle Paul preaches the gospel and, and people get saved. And all throughout history, there are people that have been preaching the gospel and, and people have been getting saved. Men and women all over the world, in every continent that you can imagine, people all over the world are preaching the gospel and people are getting saved. And so that rescue plan wasn't just for a season, wasn't just for a moment, but the rescue plan continues to this day. It's for you and for me. And so in this story that we read, we read about this interaction that Jesus had with his disciples and it tells us that, that Jesus saw the people and, and, and he was moved with compassion. And, and, and he wasn't moved with condemnation. He wasn't moved with indignation. He was moved with compassion. And so I want to talk to you about this story and things that we could learn. Because I think at the end of the day, I think we have to remember that as a church, as no matter, no matter how long you've been walking with Christ or how long you've been a person of faith, listen, God calls us to, to preach the gospel, to save souls. Amen? He tells us to save souls, to get people saved. So I want us to look at this, this, these verses, and here's our point number one. Number one, we see that Jesus was on the move. The Bible tells us in verse 35 that Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages. Jesus was actively going from town to town. He wasn't waiting for people to come to him. He didn't wait for people to come to him. He wasn't waiting for people to find him where he was at. The Bible says that he would go from town to town, from village to village. So he was on the move. He wasn't stationary. So I'm thinking about this. If Jesus wanted to make it very easy for himself, he could have gone outside Damascus or outside Capernaum or outside Jerusalem to a plot of land where there was a big field and some trees where, where if they needed shade, they could get shade. He could have gone and, and set up a tent, you know, a really nice tent and, and said, listen, if anybody needs to be healed, here's my address. Come and see me. If he wanted to make it easy on himself, he could have let people know, hey, if you want to hear some really good teachings, come to where I'm at here on Sunday mornings at 8.30, 10.30, and 12.30, and we're going to give you some good, some good teachings. He could have made it easy on himself, but he didn't do that. He didn't go set up shop somewhere waiting for people to come to him. The Bible says that he traveled to where the people were. He was the one who took the initial step. He was the one who wasn't stagnant. He was the one who wasn't stationary, who wasn't idle, who wasn't in a fixed position. No, he would travel from town to town, from village to village. Think about that for just a moment. See, many of us, many of us, we, we've experienced faith in Christ, and I believe that God is calling us to do the same thing, that God is calling us to, to go, to go and, and preach the gospel. In fact, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 tells us, he tells us, if you're my disciple, he says, preach the gospel to everyone everywhere. That means that wherever you go, wherever you go this week, there's the potential opportunity to preach the gospel. 
If, if you're doing your hobby and you're, you're playing softball or you're playing soccer or you're, you know, you're out doing things, can I tell you something? You, you, there's a potential to share the gospel with somebody that's, that's on your team. If you're going to school, there's a potential to share your faith with somebody. If you're going to your job, see, the, the opportunities are all around you. You say, I, I never see them. Well, it's because you're not looking for them. But see, many of the times as Christians, we, we fall into this trap, and it is a trap where we, we take on this attitude, of this, and this attitude is this. It's like, well, if people want to know what I've experienced, I'm going to let them come to me. If people want to know what I've experienced in my life and the joy that i found and the freedom that i found and the salvation that I, if people want to experience that, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to tell them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for them to come to me. But as I see it, th that's not what Jesus did. Jesus went to them. Now, some of you could say, no, pastor, how about the woman with the issue of blood? She went to Jesus, and, and, and she went and touched him. Yes, but he was traveling through that area, so she found out, and she went to him. How about the man who, 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 who was lowered to Jesus on the mat? Yes, because Jesus had been traveling and stopped there to preach, and that's when they brought the man to Jesus. How about Zacchaeus? No, he went to find Jesus, and he climbed on a tree. Yes, but Jesus was walking through that area, and that's why he got on a tree. See, it's one thing, watch, to, to, to wait for people to come to you. It's another thing to be in motion, to be actively, right, pursuing people, actively looking for, for opportunities to share your faith. And in that pursuit, in that action, people will find you. Jesus made it his, his business to go and to, and to look for these people. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said these words. He goes, I have come to seek and save that which was lost. In other words, Jesus is the one seeking out. What did Jesus tell his disciples in John 15? He said this at the very end, right before he was arrested. He gave him, he gave him a glimpse into his heart and into his mindset. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. So in other words, again, God, to his son Jesus, was actively looking for people. And you know that it's still like that today? That Jesus is still looking for people. He's still on the move. He said, he is? Yes. He's on the move through you and through me. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us that we are ambassadors for Christ. That we are his representatives. That wherever we go, we represent him. I represent Jesus when I go to the gym. I represent Jesus when I go to the restaurant. I represent Jesus when I go to the family event. I represent Jesus wherever I go. So if that's true about his children, then let me ask you a question. How well are you doing? See, because I'm not just, I don't just go to the restaurant. I don't just go to my job. I don't just go to school. Listen, when you understand that Jesus goes with us and through us, that we are the hands, that we are the feet, that we are the mouth, that we are the voice of Christ, that wherever we go, then listen, I don't just go to my job, I'm being sent to my job. I don't just go to school, I'm being sent to my school. I don't just go and hang out with my friends, I'm being sent to my friends. I'm being sent to my school. I'm being sent to that family gathering. I'm being sent to that life group. I'm being sent to that coffee house. I'm being sent to that restaurant. Every place I go, there's a potential to share my faith with others. See, he went. Number two, Jesus, as he went, he carried a different message. He had a different message. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Listen to what it says in verse 35, the second part of it. It says that Jesus went and he was teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news. Everybody say good news. So how many of you know that the opposite of good news is bad news? Like for us to understand that he was announcing the good news about the kingdom, we have to understand, we have to put that in context. And what is the context? The, in other words, what were the times that he was living in? The times that Jesus was living in, that he was ministering in, there was a lot of bad news. There was political turmoil. The Jews were divided. They, they, there was different branches or different uh, or, you know, groups of people fighting against each other. You had the Hellenists. You had the Sadducees. You had the Pharisees. You had... You had the zealots. You had, I mean, there, there was all these groups. You had the political turmoil that had the, 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 the Samaritans. And you had the, the Roman military and the Roman officials. And so there was all these groups 
that were literally at war with each other, not, not physically necessarily, but just a war of words, a conflict, social and political conflict. That's what Jesus, that was the environment where Jesus was ministering, a political conflict. But there was also, there was deep-rooted racism. The Jews hated the Romans, the Romans hated the Jews, the Jews hated the Samaritans, the Samaritans hated the Jews, and everybody hated each other because of, the, of their nationality and their race. So this is, there was a lot of bad news, a lot of bad things going on. Then there was, they were unsure about the future. The Jews were wondering, are we ever going to get free from these Romans? Are we ever going to get free from the Roman Empire? So they were unsure about the future. And then on top of that, they were unsure about the economy because the economy, the economic situation, the, the Jews were heavily taxed by the Roman government. And so they had to pay so many taxes to the government that people were unsecure about or insecure about their economic future. Uh, listen, think about this. Let me just, you know, Wrap this up here. Watch this. So political turmoil, social turmoil, racial uh, tensions, uh, economic tensions, all these things. Does that sound familiar? You know, the Bible tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. That what is, is, what was, is, and will be again. Like there's nothing, anything new under the sun. So watch, if, if I wanted to make this message and, and, and share with you bad news today. I could share with you a lot of bad news today. Can I give you some bad news? Everybody, watch. Let me show you. No, I'm not going to give you bad news. Because how many of you know that God didn't call us to preach bad news? He called us to preach good news. What is, what is the good news that, that God has called us to preach? It says here, it says that, that he went teaching in the synagogue and teaching them about the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. Now watch, everyone in this room, this is a whole teaching in itself, which, by the way, we teach in one of our leadership classes on School of Leadership. We teach about the kingdom of God, 13 weeks, 12 weeks. It's amazing. It's powerful. Watch this. Everyone in this room is living under a kingdom. Everyone is. I'm not going to get too deep here, but watch. You're either living under God's kingdom, the enemy's kingdom, or your kingdom. And your kingdom is, a, is, is not real. You're either under God's or the enemies, period. And guess what? Depending on the kingdom that you're living in, that's the thing that controls you. Hello, somebody. I know no one's controlling me. You're deceived. Someone rules over your heart. Someone is, you're under someone's kingdom. And so what Jesus does, he comes in, he says, he's basically saying, listen, it's not about a Jewish kingdom. It's not about a Samaritan kingdom. It's not about a Roman kingdom. It's about the kingdom of heaven. It's about the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. And watch, he says, when you become a citizen of this kingdom, when you come under the umbrella of the kingdom, the good news is this, is that now God becomes your provider. Come on, God becomes your security. God becomes, come on, your shield. God becomes your peace. God becomes your joy, right? Come on, somebody. Are you hearing me today? See, see, I, I stop and think. I stop and think for just a moment. I stop and think about about all the stuff that they that they that they experience. You know, all the stuff that they heard. But then Jesus comes along and he says, "In the kingdom of God, you're no longer a, you're no longer captive. You're free. You're no longer sick. You're healed. You're not impoverished. You're prosperous. You're not broken. You're whole. You're not you're not a peasant. Come on, you are prosperous." You're royalty. You're not condemned. You're forgiven. You're not an outcast. You're family. You're not overwhelmed. You're overcome. You're not cursed. You're blessed. You're not empty. You're filled with the Spirit of God. That's the kingdom of God. So if you're here today and you find yourself anxious, you find yourself angry, you find yourself bitter, you find yourself broken, lost, all these different things, can I tell you something? There's good news. There's another kingdom that you can live under. There's another kingdom. See, because how many of you know that the kingdom is always tied to the king? So who's your king? <laughs> when I come under the, the good news, the good news is, is that I'm under a different kingdom, that, that you're invited into a different kingdom. You see, a lot of times people, people are good at, at trying to scare people into the kingdom. And, and, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that's a good strategy. Now, don't, now don't get me wrong. You know, what do I mean by that? Like, we want to scare, we want to tell people, like, we want to scare them into the kingdom and tell them about hell and the devil. 
Lucifer. Some people think that, that Lucifer is, is, is female because her, her name is Lucy. Come on, somebody. No, I'm playing. Lucifer. Come on. No, it's a demon from hell. Come on. Watch this. And we try to, we preach about hell, and we're like, man, if without Jesus, you're going to hell. You're like salivating when you say it. Come on, watch it. Yeah, I, I smell hell all over you. I don't know what hell smells like, like sulfur and fire and, and burning. I don't know what that was. It was probably just a barbecue. I don't know what it is. We try, to, we try to use hell as a motivation. And don't get me wrong, hell is a reality. And hell is, is, is a real place where, where, where those who have rejected Christ, for those who, who reject Christ and they say, no, I don't want him. Guess the Bible does say that that is a place, where it is a real place where people will go to be judged. But that's not the good news. That's the bad news. Like telling somebody you're going to hell, not, not the, probably not what you want to lead with. Here's the good news, you don't have to go. Here's the good news is that Jesus made a different path. That Jesus came to wash away your sins. That Jesus came to make all things new. That as far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin, never to be, never to be brought up ever again. Amen? That, that, now watch, please, please understand me. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying that this is a, a blank check that I came to Jesus in my life and now I get to do whatever I want. No, the Bible tells us that having received the grace of God, would we trample on Christ's cross again? I don't, I don't get the, the cross and the, the grace of God so that I can go and fulfill the desires of my flesh. I get it so that I can live a free life in Christ. See, some people think, well, I got saved, now I'm free to do. No, you are free from those things. Not free to, but free from. He had a different message. That's the good news of the kingdom, is that you don't have to be broken. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be stressed out. This is what the, the Apostle Paul meant when he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel or the good news about Christ. I love that. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. I mean, think about this, ladies, men. Imagine for just a moment, here you are, you're married 20 years, and your spouse is ashamed to present you to others. Is that your husband? Maybe. <laughs> Why? Is that your wife? Uh, depends. That's how sometimes we treat our, our faith. Are you a Christian? Why are you asking? Why do you want to know? Maybe. Depends. On Sundays, maybe. Sometimes. For I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. It is the gospel that saved my life. It's the gospel that healed me. It's the gospel. Come on, that set me free. It's the gospel that changed the course of my family, the course of my marriage. It's the gospel that, that takes me to victory, that takes me to blessing, that takes me to prosperity. I'm not ashamed of it. Yes, yes, this is the thing that changed my life. Would you like to know about it? <laughs> Now, Pastor, you just sound like a crazy man. No, I'm an excited man. I'm an enthusiastic man. I'm passionate because what I was, I was once lost, and he found me. I was once broken, and he made me whole. I was once confused, but he clarified everything for me. I was once lost in my sin, but I found a Messiah. I found a Jesus that loves me. How could I be ashamed of that? Can't be ashamed of it. So I was like, well, I don't know. I don't just. I don't want to offend anybody, you know. And if I if I share a verse, people are gonna get mad at me, and and, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna excommunicate me from the from the group in the in, in the in, in the in break room, and I'm not gonna be able to eat with anybody anymore. I mean, seriously. He had a different message. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I believe that God is looking for a group of people that are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Men and women that are not ashamed of the gospel. They're, they're, they're saying, I'm not ashamed of the story that transformed your life. The story that transformed your family. See, the Bible says that, number three, that Jesus was filled with compassion. Listen to what it says in Matthew 9.36. It says that when he saw the crowds, he saw the people. And it says he had compassion. On them when they were confused and helpless and like sheep without a shepherd. I, it's interesting that that Jesus would, would, would look at the crowds of people that were following him. And it's interesting that he would see he would compare them to sheep without a shepherd. Now, I'm no farmer. I'm no rancher. 
But I do have the internet. Come on, somebody. And how many of you know that you can Google stuff, right? And you can research stuff. And so I remember going on, just as I read that, I said, like, okay, I, I put in, why do sheep need a shepherd? And in essence, I've discovered, and please, if you have sheep, no offense to your sheep, but according to the research, sheep are dumb. They're, they don't make good decisions all the time. I think there's a reason that God says that we are the sheep of his pasture. Come on. Let's be honest. Like, has anybody ever or has anybody never done a dumb thing? Raise your hand. You lie. You just did. Everyone in this room, we've done dumb things. In fact, people are still doing dumb things. All you got to do is look at TikTok, the reels on Instagram. Go look at the videos on Facebook. How many of you sometimes spend an hour and a half laughing at people? <laughs> You're sharing stuff. Guilty. Right? We look at people and oh, there's, it's, it's one thing for them to do crazy things and we say, oh, they're dumb. But how about when they're doing things that are destructive and, and we look at people and family members and friends and they're making bad choices and we just go, man, that's so dumb. So dumb. You want to know why? Because there's sheep without a shepherd. Because what I learned about a shepherd is the shepherd, listen, why does sheep need a shepherd? Because it's the shepherd that, that, that protects them from attack. It's the shepherd, listen, without, without a shepherd, the sheep will wander and get lost. They, they, they'll, they'll, that's why in the scriptures it talks about the lost sheep. He drifted from the shepherd. It, without, without, without a shepherd, the sheep would starve because they'll take up all the grass and, and they don't know where to go next. And so it's the shepherd that then leads them to fresh pastures so they can eat, so they can be nourished. Without a shepherd, I learned that, that, that not only will they starve, but the sheep can, can get damaged and, and, and literally get killed in harsh weather. In other words, they don't know how to find shade on their own. They don't know how to find protection on their own. But it's the, the shepherd that leads them to protection. And the Bible says that when, when Jesus saw the people, he saw them as sheep. Without a shepherd. And, and notice, notice what it says. That when he saw them, it says he had, he had what? He had what? Oh, okay. Can I tell you that sometimes, could it be the reason, the reason we don't share our faith with others is because we don't have compassion, but instead we have condemnation. Or we have criticism. Yeah. We criticize them. You go, those dumb people. They're like dumb sheep, like Pastor said. They're just making dumb decisions after dumb. De they, they deserve what they get. How many of you know that's not compassion? That's condemnation. Yeah. When God sees the lost and the broken, he doesn't see condemnation. He sees he's moved but with compassion. Because condemnation doesn't change anybody. Condemnation pushes people away, but compassion draws them in. Right? Condemnation pushes people away. Compassion draws them in. I shared in our early service today that there used to be, a, there was a moment in my life where I would get around certain people and there was very little compassion and a lot of condemnation. I'm going to be honest with you, transparent. I get around a certain group of people in certain places and, and they, they would get me angry. And, 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 and I could, I'd be around them, and, and I'd say, God, God, get them. Get them, Lord. Just get them. And, and not in a good way. Not get them. Like, not get them. Get them. <laughs> you know? Get them. And I, and I would get around them, and I would, it would make me angry. And I was like, to a point where, like, it would just, it would change me. And I was like, oh, I couldn't stand it. Like, get them, Lord, get them. And one day, one of those, one of those fits of, non-compassion, come on somebody, one of those moments, I was like, God, get them, Lord, God, I can't stand that they're doing this, and, oh. and God says, you want me to get them like I got you? But God, I, I'm not like them, like what, like you never sin? <laughs> Lord, this is just righteous anger, no, that's unrighteous condemnation, he goes, you want me to get them like I got you? Like you, did, did, I, did I zap you? Did I crush you? 
Did I judge you or did I embrace you? I'm like, I guess I'm a dumb sheep, right, God? <laughs> and sometimes, watch, we, we look at humanity, we look at people, we look at, and you know, sometimes we're harder on the people that are closest to us. Our, our kids, our family, and we're like, we, we feel like there's more liberty there to be more condemning to them because they're closer to us. And it's all coming from a good place. I love them so I can condemn them. Wrong. And so I just remember that God dealt with me on that. And now instead of looking at that and being around people, this group of people that would just get me so upset, I would be condemning. God showed me that I had to be compassionate. That it's compassion that changes people. And isn't it interesting? Sometimes people say, I don't want to go to church because they judged me there. They judged me there. Well, it's one thing. Watch this. I, I think sometimes people can confuse judgment in church with conviction of the Holy Spirit, first of all. I think it's important that as a church we never judge anybody. It says, don't judge lest he be judged. And, we're, and what's he talking about? There? He's talking about the heart. You can't judge someone's heart. You can't judge someone's heart. Right? But watch this. What I want to get at today is this, is that when you see someone who's lost or far away from God, are you moved with compassion or are you moved with condemnation? When you're moved with compassion, you're going to want to share how Jesus helped you. You're going to want to share, listen, this is who I was and this is what happened. And this is what God did. Because watch this. This leads to my final point is this, is that Jesus gives the solution. Get, now Jesus gives the answer. Like are there all these people here, all these crowds like sh with sh like. Sheep without a shepherd, they're hurting, they're lost. It says that he was moved with, with compassion. That word compassion literally means empathy. He empathized with them. And the Bible says, watch this, it says in the next verses, then he turned to the disciples and he gives them the answer to this, to this issue. He says in verse 37, 38, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So notice the issue isn't that there's not enough people that need Jesus the issue is there's not enough workers to go get the people, right? So then he says in verse 38, pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. So if you read that, you say like, amen, we need to pray for more workers. We need to pray that God would send out more people into the schools, into the universities, into the jobs. We need to send more people into the community. We need to send people everywhere. God, send more people. Watch this. God wasn't necessarily telling them send more people. Jesus wasn't saying this to his disciples. Don't just pray for more people to go out into the harvest fields. What he was literally telling them is pray that God would send you. Because we always, we're always ready to volunteer others, right? <laughs> Aren't we? Like we want, we want to, we want to voluntold people. <laughs> we're gonna do this. You're gonna go there. You're gonna do that. Some of us, we're professional bosses. Come on, somebody. We're ready to sign up. We we need life groups. I signed you up for life group. We're going to have a fellowship. I signed you up for the platter. <laughs> like, well, what are you bringing? Paper plates. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks for $3.50. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We're always ready to volunteer other people. Let other people do the work. Let other people go. Let other... But Jesus wasn't saying, just pray for more workers. He was literally telling them, pray that God would send you. He said, well, pastor, but he just said in the verse right there, he says, pray for more workers, to send more workers. Yes, but watch this. If you look at the very next chapter, the very next verse, listen to what it says. In the very next verse, the very next uh, uh, chapter, it says this in, in Matthew 10, verse uh, 1, and then we'll skip down to verse 5, and he says, then Jesus called his disciples together. This is after he told them to pray for workers, and he says he called them together, and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits, to heal every kind of disease and illness. Skip down to verse 5. And then he, he sent out the 12 disciples. He sent them out. After telling them, pray for more workers. Okay, I'm going to pray for more workers. Okay, I'm sending you out. Wait, 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 what? I've been praying for workers. You are the workers. You and I, we are the workers. If you skip down to verse 7, it says this. It says, go and announce to them, the people, that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, and cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. So I have a question for everyone in this room. We're, we're going to wrap up here in just a moment. How many of you, 
How many of us in this room have freely received of the goodness and the blessings of God? Raise your hand. Come on, keep it up. Keep it up. Don't, 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 don't put them down. Right? If, you've, if God has really been good to you, raise your other hand. All right, now surrender. <laughs> Watch. That means that everyone with their hands up, you're, you're a prospect to be used by God. That you can go out this week and you can preach the good news and you can heal the sick and you can cast out the demons. And you, oh my goodness, I'm preaching better than you're clapping, amen? See, it, see, a lot of us, we have a reactive faith. We have a, we have a passive faith. We, we don't mind having faith as long as it, it doesn't demand us to do anything with it. That's a powerless faith. That's a purposeless faith. That's a, that's a faith that doesn't, that doesn't impact the world. Do you want to know what the world needs? You want to know what America needs? It needs the church to rise up. It needs men and women of faith to rise up. Do you want to know what our schools need? It needs godly teachers, amen? Christ-centered teachers, Christ-centered administrators. Do you want to know what Washington needs? It needs to be cleansed, amen? It needs good, Christian, spirit-filled men and women to lead this country. Do you want to know what the answer to addiction is? It's Jesus. Do you want to know the answer to broken homes is? It's Jesus. Do you want to know what the answer to is to anxiety? It's Jesus. To depression? Jesus. Mental health? Jesus. You list it, it's always going to be Jesus. But men and women of God, when will you rise up? When will you step out? When will you share your story? When will you say, Lord, here am I, send me? When will you begin to see people through the eyes of compassion instead of condemnation? When will you be brave and bold and say, Lord, this week I'm going to share my faith with somebody. Lord, this week I'm going to tell my son. I'm going to tell my wayward daughter. I'm going to tell my rebellious cousin. I'm a, I'm a, when will you rise up? The time, if not now, then when? If not now, then when? When is your moment? Well, I'm not ready. Well, I'm here to tell you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you are ready. Did he just do the, this on me? I don't know why I did that. This is my Latin American heritage. I don't know what it is. Santo. <laughs> Everyone has a story that they can share this week. How did Jesus change your life? Share that story. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. I'm getting a little excited here. <laughs> the solution, listen, the, the, the solution is here. It's right now. It, Jesus didn't just ask us to pray for more workers. He said, he says, you are the workers. You are the workers. Think about this for just, right, for just a moment right now. Who are the people in your life that you know need Jesus? For, for, forget, for, you know, a lot of times they're like, Lord, I wish you would send me to China, Lord. Send me, send me across the ocean. Send me to Hawaii. Yeah, right. Lord, send me, send me so I can be a, a, a vessel around the world. And God's like, could you just be a vessel like to your neighbor? How about you start with that person right there next to you? Come on, somebody. Someone say amen. Someone say ouch. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. We hope you're blessed by today's video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow our social media platforms in the description below. God bless.